back at it again with the Mobius Dickus, chapter 34, the cabin, cabin table, pardon me. So, in this chapter, we are going to have a demonstration of the abstract ideas presented in the previous chapter, where we asked ourselves, how does power exercise itself? What convinces people that some people in their society are more powerful or interesting or famous or important than other people? Like, how does that work? We're going to contrast how Ahab achieves that end with how the harpooners achieve that end. So first, let's look at Ahab. So let's look at this passage right here. But he who in the rightly regal and intelligent spirit presides over his own private dinner table of invited guests, that man's unchallenged power and dominion of individual influence for the time, that man's royalty of state transcends Belshazzar's, for Belshazzar was not the greatest. Who has but once dined his friends, has tasted what it is to be Caesar? It is a witchery of social czarship, which there is no withstanding. Now, if to this consideration you super add the official supremacy of a shipmaster, then by inference you will derive the cause of that peculiarity of sea life just mentioned. So what Ishmael is saying is that for some reason, there's some expectation that the host of a dinner party generally controls how the evening goes. Why is that the case? Unclear. It's usually the product of like, tradition or ritual or it's just kind of the way that it is it's unquestioned it's unconscious right so that unconsciousness that people have in terms of like letting people who happen to and be inviting you to dinner to dictate everything you do that evening be it go play a board game or watch a movie or go talk outside will relate to ahab's unconscious exertion of his power so let's take a look at some of the examples where Ahab doesn't even need to explicitly articulate through force his dominance over the three mates, but it's just kind of understood. So the first example comes from when he's serving meat, and it says, For like the coronation banquet at Frankfurt, where the German emperor profoundly dines with his seven imperial electors, so these cabin meals were somehow solemn meals, eaten in awful silence, and yet at table, old Ahab forbade not conversation. So even though there's this ritual, there's this tradition which establishes norms that Ahab seemingly likes, he doesn't need to say it, right? Power often operates within cycles of shared understanding that can even be unconscious. Same thing in the second one. For Flask to have presumed to help himself, this must have seemed to him tantamount to larceny in the first degree. Had he helped himself at that table, doubtless never more would he have been able to hold his head up in this honest world. Nevertheless, strange to say, Ahab never forbade him. So same thing here, right? Ahab doesn't have to say to Flask that he can't serve himself, but it is in subconscious, understood, ingrained power relationship that Flask simply adheres to because it's how he thinks. Last thing here. For hereby Flask's dinner was badly jammed in point of time. Starbuck and Stubb both had the start of him, and yet they also have the privilege of lounging in the rear. If Stubb even, who is but a peg higher than Flask, happens to have but a small appetite and soon shows symptoms of concluding his repast, then Flask must bestir himself. He will not get more than three mouthfuls that day, for it is against holy usage for Stubb to proceed Flask to the, desk, to the deck. But once again, we have no articulation of why this is or, or verbal confirmation or warning it's just known so i think this is demonstrating that in many political situations and in many social situations hence the reference to the dinner party in many relations between people be it social or political power is exercised through subtle unconscious understandings through mystery through ritual uh through keeping people too scared or too ignorant or too uh, timid to question the status quo. This is the power of traditional unconscious belief. And that can apply to the stability of political regimes or why we tolerate it when someone who is throwing a party puts on music we don't like, but we don't go up to them and tell them to change it. Now contrast this with the harpooners who also establish a kind of dominance over uh, our poor friend who has to bring them, uh, bring them their dinners. Because it says, in strange contrast to the hardly tolerable constraint and nameless invisible domineerings, hence the 
if you wanted more evidence, nameless, invisible domineerings of the captain's table, was the entire carefree license and ease, the almost frantic democracy of those inferior fellows, the harpooners. While their masters, the mates, seemed afraid of the sound of the hinges of their own jaws, the harpooners chewed their food with such a relish that there was a report to it. So these people are going wild, right? Buck wild. And then here we have Do Doughboy, our cook, who has to deal with this blatant exertion of power. You'll see where I'm coming from when you read. It was a sight to see Queequeg seated over against Tashtego, opposing his filed teeth to the Indians, crosswise to them, Dagu, seated on the floor for a bench would have brought his hearse-plumed head to the low car lines, at every motion of his colossal limbs making the low cabin framework to shake as when an African elephant goes passenger in a ship. But for all this, the great Negro was wonderfully abstemious, if you're curious what that means, not self-indulgent. Not to say dainty. It seemed hardly possible that by such comparatively small mouthfuls he could keep up the vitality diffused through so broad, baronial, and superb a person. But doubtless this noble savage fed strong and drank deep of the abounding element of air, and through his dilated nostrils snuffed in the sublime life of the worlds. Not by beef or by bread are giants made or nourished. But Queequeg, he had a mortal, barbaric smack of the lip in eating, an ugly sound enough, so much so that, and here's where the power relations start, that the trembling doughboy almost looked to see whether any marks of teeth lurked in his own lean arms. And when he would hear Tashtego singing out for him to produce himself, that his bones might be picked, the simple-witted steward all but shattered the crockery hanging round him in the pantry by his sudden fits of palsy. So doughboy is terrified of going out to serve Tashtego and Queequeg. Nor did the whetstone which the harpooners carried in their pockets for their lances and other weapons, and with which whetstones at dinner they would ostentatiously sharpen their knives, that grating sound did not at all tend to tranquilize poor Doughboy. How could he forget that in his island days Queequeg, for one, must certainly have been guilty of some murderous convivial indiscretion? Alas, Doughboy hard fares the wait waiter who waits upon the cannibals. Not a napkin should he carry on his arm, but a buckler, a shield. In good time, though, to his great delight, the three salt sea warriors would rise and depart. To his credulous fable-mongering ears, all their martial bones jingling in them at every step like Moorish scimitars in scabbards. So note the repeated reference to weaponry and to danger. It seems to me that, frankly, the harpooners have... Uh, a similar effect on Doughboy as Ahab has on the mates, but while some power is exercised through subtlety and mystery like Ahab, this is not unconscious exertion of power, but very open, radically transparent, obvious displays of force and brutality, which would be, I think, uh, different but equally valid in terms of its ability to get people into a power hierarchy with one another that doughboy through the obvious threatening nature of these dudes feels scared of them even though they haven't directly threatened him so i guess in some way there's a connection between their demonstration of their ability to be uh, you know violent in the way that they eat and the effect on doughboy even though he's not being directly threatened nevertheless Comparing and contrasting, the shared idea here is that power generally exercises itself in a variety of different ways. And to return to Ahab, uh, we go back to Ahab after we talk about the harpooners, and the passage says, Nor did they lose much hereby. In the cabin was no companionship. Socially, Ahab was inaccessible. Though nominally included in the census of Christendom, he was still an alien to it. He lived in the world as the last of the grizzly bears lived in settled Missouri, and as when spring and summer had departed, that wild Logan of the woods, burying himself in the hollow of a tree, lived out the winter there, sucking his own paws. So in his inclement, howling old age, Ahab's soul, shut up in the cave trunk of his body, there fed upon the sullen paws of its gloom. So not only is that passage provocative in terms of what is Ahab's sorrow, which we're going to find out very soon here in chapter 36, but I think there's some great imagery here to reaffirm the notion that for Ahab, his uh, magnetic personality is the product of his mystery, right? It says that he's inaccessible. It says that he is shut up. His soul is shut up in his body like a grizzly bear in who is, you know, burying himself in the hollow of a tree, right? Hidden, disguised, inaccessible. He is an alien to Christendom, i.e. being a kind Christian person to other people. So I think chapter 33 and chapter 34 are interesting comments on how power operates and what gets people to put themselves into relations 
with other people. And it comes down to some combination of subtlety, mystery, ritual, tradition, unconscious thought, and sometimes explicit transparent demonstration of force. Okay, see you in the next chapter.